So what I'm currently doing, to give you a way of thinking of me now instead of just thinking of me as being a preacher, I just this week started back to college for the first time in 18 years, which is mildly terrifying because I am on campus. I'm getting a degree now in music education, which is funny because that's what I started to do when I started college the first time and then ended up doing communications and then not, not using that nearly as much as I thought I would. So uh, the goal is to teach, but teach music. Now what that means is I'm on campus with a bunch of kids who literally were born the year I graduated high school, which is awkward whenever it's time to go to uh, lunch in the cafeteria. <laughs> like today, I ended up inadvertently sitting at the staff and faculty table without, mention, without realizing it, and they just accepted me because I look like I fit in there apparently, I have enough gray hair. but. Uh, that brings along some anxieties because at this point in my life, I would have envisioned myself as being fairly well along in a career and having a certain amount of stability there, if you will. Uh, and that's just not the way that things have happened. And so it's really, and I'm already sort of a, a nervous and anxious person anyway but when you start thinking about going back to school and you have a family and you start doing all of the logistics on that I don't know about you I mean I'll let you answer for yourself if you were doing that what would be one of the first things that would cross your mind as being a concern time okay okay well time time's a big one related closely to time might be what else Money, that's a big one. Time and money, and both of those go together, especially for me, in the sense of I want to have enough time to actually be around my young family and not be totally ignoring them for two years of my life. I also want to make sure that I am still providing for them while not killing myself in the process uh, of doing all of these things that again, there, there, there were nights when I would stay awake or mornings that I would wake up wondering to myself, what in the world am I thinking? And I still am sort of doing that, but it's better now that school has actually started. So along the way, uh, passages like this were ones that I kind of dove into because at the end of the day, whether it's preaching or teaching, probably not going to get rich doing either one of those. Uh, the reason that I am geared toward that in my life right now is mainly because I feel like that's where God has given me abilities and talents. And if I'm going to be the version of myself that he wants for me to be, that's what I need to do. And that's different for every person. Uh, and that's even in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have different abilities, if you will, different gifts, different parts of the body. And they all make up the body together. But that brings us to this, this feeling, though. And maybe you've experienced this before. Maybe you've even experienced this now. Of this anxiety or this worry that comes from just living life and making sure that you're going to be able to make ends meet. Or that uh, not just today, but maybe 10 or 15 or 20 or 40 years from now. Uh, all of those things are going to work out the way that they should. And so I go to Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus deals not necessarily directly with my situation. But the principles that we see right here are laid out in such a way as I think they can definitely relate to all of us. There's, there's actually two sides to this, and we want to take verses 19 through 34 together. I don't know if in your Bible, depending on what translation you have, the way the pericopes are broken up, some of them will have 19 through 24 connected to each other, and then there might be a title, then, then you have verse 25. And you've got to remember that not only were none of those numbers in there originally, but none of the titles were in there originally. And so as we read through this, I think it's helpful to view 19 through 34 as a connected a piece of text right here. So let's go ahead and, and jump into reading a little bit of this tonight, and then I want to come back and make some comments about it, and I have plenty of questions to ask you all to get you to think about things, because this is not a sermon. 
All right. Starting in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Now again, if your Bible has a title right there, just ignore that for a moment. Because what's the very first word of verse 25? Therefore. therefore and any time you see a therefore, what does that signify? What it's there, yeah, the old, yeah. When you see a therefore, you got to ask what it's there for. Okay. What it means is, what we're about to read is directly connected to some of, our, some of the reasoning the, that is given in the previous verses. So you got to look back to those previous verses to even fully comprehend what he's about to say. So, all those that we just looked at, Keep that in mind now as you read along with me here, beginning in verse 25. Does somebody want to take that next chunk, 25, to the end of the chapter? Go for it. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, <coughs> will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? After all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. All right, so let's think about this for just a minute. I just told you that I feel like it's better to take this whole chunk of text together, even if we do, and we can kind of divide it into two different sections right there. How do you think those two bigger sections are related to each other? Think about it for a minute. With your laying up treasures in heaven, you really shouldn't be so anxious about the things that are going on here. Your focus should be on your future. Well, there's that. And, and you're kind of touching on a major theme in this as well. By the way, as we read through that, how many of these are verses that you all have heard pretty much your entire life at various times? I mean, this is one of those passages that's got so many of those in it, it's really easy to go in and just cherry pick one statement out of any of this, isn't it? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Boy, that one gets ripped right out pretty quickly, doesn't it? And then even verses 19 and 20, or verse 21 by itself, sometimes where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So it relates to some of this, what you're saying about where we lay up our treasures. But what does that have to do? I mean, it's not just about not being anxious, because the reality of it is sometimes if we are laying up treasures in heaven, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit, that might mean that we're giving up some physical things which might make us feel what? <laughs> might make us feel worried or anxious, right? I mean, the whole lay up your treasures in heaven thing sounds good. Yeah! Until we start thinking about what does that really mean? What does that mean about the decisions that I make on a day-in, day-out basis? If I'm laying up my treasures in heaven and not just here on this earth. What else? What else do you think connects these two bigger chunks? I think it's kind of trying to tell you to trust in God and not to be so anxious of the life here, even though we, we do. You know, put your 
Trust more in him. Okay. That's a that's a practical application of this. I mean that's hard to do, but right. yeah. here, but I mean that's what I get out of it is he's trying to tell you more just to trust in him and he's basically just been saying, I got this. All right. Well, we're we're gonna unpack some of those things as we go through this. Let me give you a way of thinking about this then, at least the way that I think about it. This first section addresses the person who is focusing their efforts mainly on the physical world. If you look at some of the things that are said here, don't lay up treasures on earth, right? The negative command. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. And then the really confusing section about the lamp and being the eye and the body and eye and all that kind of weird stuff. We'll talk about that briefly too. But then the no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God in money. All of that chunk of section really seems to be targeted at someone with what kind of mindset? A worldly mindset. Or I don't even want to say necessarily worldly, just a physical mindset. Because, say what? Well, because when we talk about worldly, that kind of brings in sin and things like that. But I think sometimes where we get into this even as Christians is we think as long as I'm not dealing with sin, then this is not really an issue for me. But if we talk about it in terms, and I'll give you an example. In Colossians, uh, you remember Colossians 3 verses 1 through 4. What does that say about don't set your mind on things on this earth? The term literally used there is the term for dirt terra firma. So he's saying don't set your mind set your mind on things above, not on things on dirt. So world kind of applies, but it's if more tangible, it's more ta- we're talking about tangible. It, we're talking about physical existence, if that makes sense. Because if you look at it, whenever he says in verse 19, treasures on earth, and then he gives Physical consequences, right? What happens to things on earth sometimes? They decay. They wear out. They get stolen. They break. So it's about more than just sin, although there's there's a sin element to this. The idea is somebody whose mind is just focused on or predominantly focused on, and I'll say, and I'm careful to say that too, because when you get to the end there of that section, verse 24, you've got somebody who's not just focused on one master now, aren't they? Now they're trying to serve two, aren't they? So they're not just focused on one thing. They're trying to focus on more than one thing. So as you start, and and I don't want to get it all into this just yet, But as you start thinking carefully about who he's getting at right here, he's primarily dealing with a mindset that is focused on physical existence in the here and the now. And then we get to the next part. And so here's the question then. If somebody stops focusing just on the physical existence. And he doesn't necessarily state this explicitly, but I I alluded to this in what we talked about a minute ago. What might potentially be the consequence? They start feeling what? Anxious and worried. Because God, I mean, Jesus here says, lay up your treasures in heaven. Okay, so I'm not going to focus just on the physical realm. I'm going to put my energy into the eternal realm. But I've also got to do what? I mean, he doesn't just pick random things as examples in this passage in verse 25 and following, does, does he? He brings up eating. He brings up clothing, right? Those are basic necessities, aren't they? I mean, we're not talking about being rich now, are we? This is not the issue in verse 25. Oh, I'm, don't be anxious about not being rich. It's don't be anxious about or don't be worried about, depending on your translation, your life, your existence. 
So how do we then deal with that? Now, it's really, again, it's really easy to just read through this passage, I think, and get some things that at first just kind of feel good and they sound good and, and give it lip service. But not really put these things into practice or even change the way that we make decisions or the, the things that we value. Because, again, if we just keep it on a surface level understanding of these things, it never really reaches down deep enough to give us the peace that we might be looking for, to help us make the decisions that we ought to make. So he deals with that, okay, if you're going to lay up treasures in heaven, then don't worry about the other things. And he gives some reasons why that is the case, and we'll talk about that more later. Let's go back up to verse 19 and talk about some things there. So do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So I already mentioned this a minute ago, but everybody remembers Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. If somebody wants to flip over there and read it for just a moment, it's the same idea, essentially, is what he's getting at. All right, so again, one of those passages that's really easy to just read and feel good for a split second that we read it, right? There's a lot of those, aren't there? We just read them, and it feels good to have read them. <laughs> but think about the, the application of this. Again, this goes back to what we talked about a minute ago. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the dirt, this giant ball of dirt that we live on because and so what are the giant what are the things that we think about on this giant ball of dirt let's just say for a moment for the sake of argument God didn't exist <gasps> okay this is a sake for the sake of argument <laughs> and that's recorded that I said it's for the sake of argument what are the things you're going to be worried about what are the things you're going to focus on food, food. Meals. okay health, health. children we just got a dog a, a couple months ago now you know what he's worried about food getting petted not being left at the house by himself for any longer than absolutely necessary play with him every so often I mean if you stop and think about it, that is a purely physical existence, isn't it? Those are, and we have the same things. If, and we can make it more complex because we can get into the end, well, we've got planning for the future. We've got industry and technology and agriculture and things like that. And we can, we can make it more complex, but at its core, if we take God out of the equation, then there's only a certain number of things, and it's very similar to what animals worry about, right? Very similar. So now I want, to, I want you to just think about this for a second then. When he talks about where you're laying up your treasures or where your focus is, if we bring God back in, does anything look different in a person's life? I won't say your life yet, but does anything look different in the way that person or, I mean, I guess we can say you, in the way you're living your life with or without God? That, that's the question here. And that's getting at the, the laying your treasures up thing as well. What are the treasures? When he says treasures, what are these treasures? Well, I mean, he talks about both. If we're talking about physical, we're talking about 
What if, though, for just a moment, we don't try to figure out what those treasures are? What if we just leave this as a concept for a moment? What is a treasure? Something that's important to you, right? Something that you value. That's different for everybody. And that's the... You're on something right there. Because if Jesus named specific treasures right now, it would be really easy to read through there and say, oh, he didn't mention this, so does this apply to me? See, there's some genius in how vague this is. When we talk about treasures, we're talking about what? Things you value. So let's go back to our thought experiment for a minute. We have God in the equation and God out of the equation. If your concerns don't change between having God in or God out of the discussion, what does that say about your concerns? If nothing changes, if nothing would change in life, with the exception of maybe not assembling, not going to church, if nothing would change in your life, taking God out of the equation, then how much of an effect is God really having? If that's the case, then how much are you really, if we want to put it in terms of treasure right here, how much are you really focusing on or valuing, if we want to use that terminology because we're talking about treasures, things that are spiritual in nature? So Jesus says, don't value, don't put your efforts and your energy into these things that, and, and, and I know you get to a certain point in your life, you know, when you're younger, things seem like the thing, right? I don't know about you, but as I've gone along, I've, I've come to realize that as I get older, things that were bright and shiny at one time, they do eventually do what? They begin to rust. They begin to break down. I begin to think about replacing them, right? I even, back last year, I would bought some nice suits whenever I was preaching, which nobody here wears suits, so I don't guess this matters. But I had two nice suits that I had tailored. And then we sold our house and we moved into an old house that had been literally vacant for two years. We had some friends who owned it who I don't know if they've even started flipping it since we've moved out. But they let us live in that and do a little work on it and things. But when we moved in, there were moths. And my nice suits became a meal. So I, I, when I pulled my suit out for the first time and saw the little holes, I thought to myself, I really get what Jesus was saying right there. Because, I mean, these were not cheap suits. And so we can spend money and time and effort and energy on these things. And then what happens? And they go away. I mean, you can have a super nice house. But I, I drive Uber on the weekends now. I drive past a lot of buildings that I can remember when I moved here to East Tennessee, this area, 14, 15 years ago now. They didn't look nearly as grown up. The paint looked a lot nicer. The soffit wasn't falling out. You know, things like that, that happen over time. And, you, you know, at least for me, you get to a point that you wonder, well, do I really want to spend money on something if it's just going to start to break down? But that comes back to the value thing. What are we valuing? So like you said, where's our treasure? What are, what are we really focusing on doing? For verse 21 is the key to this. Once we kind of have that under our belt and in our thoughts right there where your treasury is your what your heart will be what does that mean your focus your energy your efforts and so how sad is it if all of your energy and your focus and your efforts go read Ecclesiastes and you'll really be depressed after you do that but if all of your energy and your focus goes into things that once you die Simply go to someone else or cease to exist. So what it does, what Jesus is getting at is some perspective right here. To start out with, if we're not going to be anxious or worried, we've got to start with some perspective. No matter what I do, as far as physical things go on this planet, they're all going to do what? They're all going to eventually go away. And so while I need to put some time and effort and energy into certain things, 
that in and of itself ought to be self-limiting, shouldn't it? There's only so much that I can or should. All right, so let's look at verses 22 and 23 real quick because these get real confusing. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Who has one that says if your eye is single? Translation. If your eye is single, it will be full of light. All right, so I'm going to give you my super condensed way of understanding this passage in the context here. Let's start by paralleling this with the heart, because what did he just talk about in the previous verse? Where your treasury is, your heart will be also. If you were to right now close your eyes, we even put a blindfold on so you can't cheat and, you know, detect light. <laughs> How well are you going to be able to navigate this room with all these chairs and tables with your eyes closed? Okay? In an ancient sense, your eyes allow light into your body. They literally physically do, by the way. How do you think you see anything? Photons enter through the lenses in your eyes and hit the back of your eye where then all of those electrical signals are converted by your brain into an image that you can make sense out of. So in a sense, it literally becomes the lamp of the body because light enters. And once you can see and you have the light, then you can do what? You cannot trip over that chair. On the other hand, if you close your eyes or it's dark, what happens? Or if we take this to more what the passage is saying, if your eye is bad, any of you have vision, minor vision problems that you're willing to admit to? I will tell you I'm almost legally blind, I think, if I don't have contacts or glasses in. And if I have glasses, I have to spend so much money on the lenses to not make them look like Coke bottles <laughs> that it's, I, I don't buy glasses unless I have to anymore just because of that. The point is, it's really easy to, to get yourself in trouble if you can't see very well, right? So now I bring it back to this. The eye is the lamp of the body. In other words, if we think of a lamp as allowing us to be able to move around and guide us. So if your eye is healthy, in other words, if it's letting in light well and you're able to see well, your whole body will be what? Full of light. You'll be able to navigate. Things will be good. If your eye is bad, though, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now let's think about this in context here of what we just talked about. If we're talking about walking... Essentially, what we're talking about is decision-making, right? Where do I step? Which direction do I go? How far do I go? So, can I make good decisions for my body if I don't see clearly? No, I don't. All right, so what does that have to do with anything else that we're going to look at right here in this section? <clears throat> do you think that sometimes the reason things get out of kilter in our lives, and maybe we worry is because we've stopped seeing things the right way. <coughs> we've, we've lost perspective. Our eyes are deceiving us now, if you will. Our eyes are looking at the wrong things, or they're seeing things and are, they're, it's not translating over what it is that we're actually seeing. And so we end up making what kinds of decisions? bad decisions and sometimes it even gets worse. I mean look at that statement, if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? I, I drove a man back a, a month or so ago who by all, I mean he looked normal getting in the car. As we started going down the road though, we were talking, he said yeah I used to drive Uber. And I said oh for how long? About a month. I said well what made you stop? Well I lost my sight. He had a sudden onset degenerative thing happened with his eyes where he literally lost central vision in both eyes. There's just nothing there. And so that's why I was driving him. It's because he literally can't drive. So imagine if that's your, your situation, how much trouble you could get into and how bad you can make it and you can go from bad to worse. So we'll pick up at verse 24 next week, but I do want to leave you with thinking about this. With all that being the case, what are we looking at? What's our focus on? Because we can really only effectively serve how many masters? One. 
Okay? So if we get that right, we know which one we're supposed to serve, right? I mean, it's a pretty clear statement at the end of verse 24. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. It doesn't say you might not be able to, or most people can't, but you might be the exception. It says what? You can't. So, you get to that point and you say, okay, well, I get that, so I want to serve God in whatever way God wants me to serve Him. But if I really do that, if I really do that, if I see things the way I'm supposed to see things now, if I focus on things the way I'm supposed to focus on things, if I value things the way I'm supposed to value things, that also leads me to a place where I might have some hard decisions to make. Does that make sense? In which case, we get to the next part next week. With those decisions then, how do I reconcile? Okay, and even the apostles asked this at one point, we've given up all these things for you. You remember that? What, what are we going to get? So think about that. How, how, could, how could we resolve this? Well, that's what verses 25 through 34 deal with. So didn't really get into the practical part of it, but that's next week. Just want you to think about this for a little bit over the next week. And I'll see all three of you next week whenever you come back. So. <laughs>